These are the new voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its mission, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. The Starship Enterprise, pride of the Federation of Planets' sleek fleet, streaks across the galaxy on its latest adventure. The huge vessel, home for over 400 explorers and scientists, is nearing its destination after many days in the endless reaches of black space. Their assignment? Investigate the mysterious far-off region called the Oblix Solar System. Third planet of Oblix System coming into range, Captain Kirk. Thank you, First Officer Spock. Helmsman Chekhov, please give me visual contact. Yes, Captain. The sight seen by the crew on their view screen is a wondrous one. Spinning slowly before them is a vast rocky planet, scarred a dark red by huge volcanoes that hurl great chunks of colorful lava into the air. The very surface seems to boil with liquid anger. A raw, violent planet. Spock, what does your computer say about this unexplored world? Allow me to check the readout, Captain. Its sun is a yellow dwarf much like Earth's own. Its atmosphere is thin, but breathable and capable of sustaining food and life forms. Is there anything remotely human there now? On this nearly formed planet? Hardly, Captain. Given its similarity to Earth, I would say life forms would not develop for, oh, approximately 124,426,682.34 years yet. That's the approximate figure, Mr. Spock? Approximately, yes. Would you like me to compute the exact figure? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Spock. The approximate figure will do just fine. Well, since there's nothing to find on the third planet, I think it should be safe to move on to the sec... Wait a moment, Captain. The computer is sounding a warning. Why, this is incredible. Absolutely fascinating. I could scarcely credit... Ensign Solo, please turn off the alarm. Spock, what is it? Unbelievable as this may seem, Captain, my sensors show that on the far side of this planet, there lives intelligent life. On that ball of fire and ash? Impossible. As impossible as it seems, Mr. Chekhov. My equipment says that it is true. On the other side of this earthquake and volcano-wracked world, there live creatures as complex as you or I. And if that is true, their lives are in deadly danger. No human could survive on this primitive planet for more than a day. Mr. Chekhov, contact Chief Engineer Scott, Medical Officer McCoy, and Security Officers Tanker and Wadsworth immediately. Have them meet Mr. Spock, Mr. Zulu, and myself in the transporter room. There isn't a second to lose. We're beaming down to that planet. The intrepid Captain Kirk, his half-human, half-Vulcan science officer, Mr. Spock, and their cantankerous colleague, Dr. Bones McCoy, quickly decided to find the advanced life forms and bring them up to the ship. Joining them on the dangerous mission was the Enterprise's resident history buff, Mr. Sulu, and two tough, muscular security men. Remember the location I gave you, Scotty. As soon as you hear my signal on that communicator, use the transporter to beam us back up. Got it? Hi, Captain. Everyone ready? Mr. Sulu? Yes, Captain. Wadsworth? Tanker? Ready. All set. Mr. Spock. I am in position and prepared, Captain. Bones. I don't see why we have to check out this flaming world in the first place. It's as barren as a burned-up cornfield. I take it that means you're ready, Doctor. All right, Scotty. Beam us down. Energize. I told you, there's nothing here but red-hot lava and burned-out craters. I think all the heat warped your machine sensors, Spock. Anyone with half a brain can see there's no life here. My machine, as you call it, Doctor, is far more exact than your instincts. And thankfully, it uses more of its brain than you do. Now take it easy, you two. If the ship's computers say that there's life on this planet, I believe it. They've never been wrong before. It's incredible, Captain. This planet is almost an exact replica of Earth during its prehistoric Cretaceous period. Cretaceous? A time of Earth's history when dinosaurs ruled the planet, Captain. More than 130 million years from the year 2000, using pre-stardate time. Incredible. Incredible, maybe, Captain, but I don't like the looks of this place. Other than those foaming, fire-spitting mountains, it seems empty. But I could have sworn I saw some shadows moving near those clouds up there. Spock? According to my portable tricorder, Captain, there is no intelligent life in the nearby area. There, what did I tell you? There's nothing worth seeing here. Spock's dang, blared, flaming computer was all wrong. Look out! <laughs> Just as the hardy security man shouted his warning, a horrible winged monster screamed out of the sky. It was as big as a baseball field with wings that filled the sky. Its large burning red eyes steered right through them, and its sharp pointed beak snapped open and closed like two sharp swords. 
tiny wicked claws on both wings quivered with bloodthirsty want. One moment it soared across the sky, the next it blocked out the sun, moving in a brutal dive and heading right for them. Quick, get behind this rock. Boom, fuck, hurry. Doctor, I believe you said anyone with half a brain could see that there's no life here. Isn't that correct? Uh, that's enough, you two. Is everyone all right? Captain, Captain, that was a pterodactyl. A terra what all? A pterodactyl, a prehistoric bird. I wish it were a prehistoric pussycat, because here it comes again! Everyone get your laser weapons. Put it to stun power. Fire at will. The beams are hurting it! There seems to be a protective layering of skin that neutralizes our phasers, Captain. Intensify your weapons to their greatest strength. Fire! Still nothing! The beams bounce right off! What is going to stay? Although I do not entirely agree with Mr. Wadsworth's hysterical reaction, Captain, I think it would be wise to find a more secure location for defense. What Spock is trying to say, Jim, is that we had better hide someplace and quick. Crudely translated, Doctor, but roughly adequate, yes. Especially since the pterodactyl seems to be engaging the help of some friends. Captain Kirk looked up to see four more monstrous winged creatures joining its ugly brother. Soon the entire sky was filled with screaming, flapping, bloodthirsty beasts. Quickly, everyone, head for that cave over there. It's our only chance. Keep firing as you retreat. Wadsworth, look where you're going. There's a rock in your path. Wadsworth, don't stop, Jim. Keep running. You'll be killed. Wadsworth is stunned, Bones. I can't leave him there. Wadsworth, are you all right? Being strange. Uzi. Come on, put your arms around my neck. There. Now, come on, man. Move it, or we'll be dinosaur meat. Everyone make it? Is everyone all right? Pterodactyls. A whole fleet of pterodactyls. Unreal. I do believe we have all arrived in one piece, Captain. Our primary concern at this point should be, where do we go from here? A point well taken, Spock. Any suggestions, everyone? I say Scotty should beam us up immediately. I think you should get Scotty to kill those birds with photon torpedoes from the Enterprise. Hey, that's not like you, Wadsworth. You just can't kill living creatures on a whim. It would be criminal. I tend to agree with Ensign Sulu, Captain. Mr. Wadsworth seems to be talking from emotional shock brought on by his previous accident. Please watch the security officer closely, Dr. McCoy. You don't have to tell me, you pointy-eared varmint. I can see he's almost hysterical. All right, I'll just take it easy, all of you. To set the record straight, I agree with Spock and Sulu. We must search further. And since we can't go back out, we'll find another way by following the trail of golden liquid that flows by our feet. By gosh, the captain's right. Look at that golden river here. Why, it goes all the way down into the cavern. The curious crew members begin to follow the stream, which brings them deeper and deeper into the interior of the gas-spouting mountain. Finally, they emerge in a huge cavern as big as a stadium. But what they find there is the most incredible thing of all. Gems! The entire wall is made up of rare gems! Is he right, Spock? Is this cave really made up of rare jewels? According to my tricorder, yes. All around us are solid slabs of ruby, diamond, and emerald. I'm rich! I mean, we're rich! Who would have thought that such a savage planet would hold such riches? Captain Kirk, you must destroy the monsters out there and claim this wealth in the name of the Federation. Easy there, Wadsworth. I agree, Mr. Tanker. May I remind you, Mr. Wadsworth, that the first article of our Federation creed is to respect the rights of all intelligent life forms. But those creatures are just mindless monsters. Mr. Wadsworth, Mr. Spock has said that there is intelligent life on this planet, and before I kill or claim anything, I intend to find it. Just as Captain Kirk turns to follow the Golden River, a new and awful danger appears. Across the cavern, at the mouth of another cave, a long line of massive monsters appear. These new creatures walk on two gigantic legs as big as tree trunks. Their heads are as big as huge boulders, and their teeth are as big and sharp as axes. Tyrannosaurus Rex, the king of the dinosaurs, the most ferocious and powerful flesh-eating creature Earth has ever known. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat, I knew I should have stayed on the ship. Now will you do it, Captain? Now will you take my suggestion and kill these awful monsters? The brave commander of the Enterprise thought furiously as he watched the immense Tyrannosauruses line the opposite wall of the cave, roaring their angry displeasure. Should he kill the majestic beasts, as his security man suggested, and mine the rich wealth of the world? Or should he risk their own lives on a desperate hunch? We can't wait any longer. We must... Wait a minute, Captain. Mr. Sulu, you are familiar with the Earth version of this mighty dinosaur? This is no time for a history lesson, Spock. We're in danger of our lives. All in good time, Doctor. 
Mr. Sulu, answer the question. Yes. Those earthly creatures had short arms and small brains, did they not? Yes, they did, Mr. Spock. Not at all like these animals. Why, why these creatures have long arms, almost human shape, with three jointed claws. And their skulls, their skulls are much bigger than the prehistoric Earth Tyrannosaurus. Captain, I submit that these monsters are not monsters at all, but the intelligent life my sensors picked up. That's ridiculous, Spock, even for you. The next thing you'll be telling me is that this golden river we've been following is made of liquid gold. It is. What? What is that? It feels like it's coming from inside my head. It is Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise. Both your first officer and medical officer are correct. We, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, are the leading life form on this planet. Up until now, we thought you were pirates, trying to steal our riches and molten gold. But when your Mr. Spock correctly guessed our secret, we knew you had come in peace. Scientific logic, if you please. No guesswork. I also reason that you are masters of mental communication. Yes, Mr. Spock. We speak without speaking, transferring our words directly to your brains. It has been many eons since any other creature understood us. We naturally attack without first trying to communicate. Now that we know you are equal to us, we can make peace between our two kinds. Oh, no, you don't. Talking dinosaurs, rivers of gold, you can't fool me, you lousy monsters. You just want to kill us all and save all these jewels for yourself. Well, I won't let you, you hear? I won't let you. Take this, you lousy murdering monsters. No. You will disequalize the organic interior of the cavern. The entire mountain will be destroyed. Greedy fool! Ah! Jim, quick! Call Scotty, beam us up! There's not enough time, Doctor. Our only hope are the dinosaurs. Tanker, you go on ahead. Clear a way for us to the front of the cave. I'll carry Wadsworth on my back. King Dinosaurs, can you... Will you help us? Yes. Do not attempt to escape on foot. You will never make it. Quickly, mount us. Sit upon our backs. We will run you to freedom. Just as enormous hunks of glittering gems crash down all around them, the Enterprise crew scramble onto their new scaly allies. Jim, hurry! The Tyrannosaurus's tremendous legs propel the group through the caverns with blinding speed. Their immense weight shakes the mountain as if it were gripped by the power of a hundred earthquakes. Finally, just as the entire mountainside collapses inward with a numbing thunder, the crew reaches daylight. We made it! We're alive! Well, another solar system explored and another inhabited planet signed up as a member of the Federation. I would say it was a job well done, wouldn't you, Bones? No thanks to Spock's blasted instruments. If they had pinpointed the intelligent dinosaurs on the planet in the first place, we wouldn't have been in such trouble. But anyone with half a brain would have known there was no intelligent life there. Is that not so, Doctor? Well, <clears throat> I think I have some work to do in the sick bay, if you'll excuse me. Ah, going to work on the other half of your brain, eh? <laughs> <laughs>